Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for tuning in tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to introduce this event with Jarvis Givens, presenting his new book, Fugitive Pedagogy, Carter G. Woodson and the Art of Black Teaching, joined in conversation by Joshua Bennett. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our ever-expanding digital community during these unprecedented times. We host virtual events like tonight's five times a week. You can find our event schedule on our website at harvard.com events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our bookshelves from home. This evening's event will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask our speakers something, please go to the Q&A chat at the bottom of the screen where you can submit a question. We'll get through as many as time allows. Also, just a reminder that if you would like closed captions, you may click the live transcript tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen now. Uh, in a couple of minutes in the Zoom chat, I will be sharing a link to purchase tonight's featured book, Fugitive Pedagogy. If you would like to support our store in a different way, I will be sharing a donation link to Harvard Bookstore too. I would like to say a tremendous thank you for your patronage during these strange virtual times. Your support makes this author series possible and ensures the future of the landmark independent bookstore. And finally, as you have likely experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may and do arise. Um, and if they do, I'll do my best to resolve it quickly. So thank you for your patience and your understanding. And now I am very excited to introduce tonight's speakers. Dr. Jarvis Givens scholarship has informed education research at the intersection of race, power and schooling. Having earned his doctorate in African diaspora studies from UC Berkeley, he's currently assistant professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Suzanne Young Murray assistant professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. Dr. Givens is also the co-editor of the book, We Dare Say Love, Supporting Achievement in the Educational Life of Black Boys. Tonight, he's joined in conversation by writer, educator, and artist, Joshua Bennett. Dr. Bennett is the author of Being Property Once Myself and the poetry collections, Ode and the Sobbing School. He's currently the Mellon Assistant Professor of English and Creative Writing at Dartmouth College. Tonight, the two will be discussing Dr. Gibbons' first book, Fugitive Pedagogy, hailed as brilliantly argued, rigorously researched, and groundbreaking. Imani Perry writes of the book, in this transformative work, Givens rigorously examines critical pedagogy as an essential element, situated at the very heart of Black studies from its beginnings. Furthermore, Henry Giroux writes of the text, Givens not only unearths a hidden history of educational struggle, he also offers educators a resource for rethinking the meaning and purpose of education and pedagogical struggle as tools of enlightenment, struggle, and racial justice. We are so pleased to have the two of them here for this event tonight. So without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Dr. Gibbons. Thank you so much for that um, generous introduction. Uh, and I wanna say thank you uh, to Harvard Bookstore, but also to the Gutman Library at the Harvard Graduate School of Education for collaborating to bring us together um, to gather to talk about my first book, which I'm really excited to share with you all. Um, and I'm especially excited to be in conversation with um, Professor Joshua Bennett, who's been a good friend of mine and along uh, the ride for the journey as I wrote this book when I got to Harvard, um, starting when I got to Harvard in 2016 as a postdoc. We were both postdocs at the time, but we really kind of uh, wrote our, our books and our projects together in collaboration. And so it's very fitting for us to be here discussing this work today together. Um, I'm going to share uh, some short comments, about 20 minutes of, of, of comments based on the book. Um, and then after that, we're going to transition into a conversation between myself and Professor Bennett. And so I'm now going to share my screen. Um, and if the, the representative at Harvard Bookstore can enable the screen sharing, uh, that would be great because it says host disabled screen sharing. All right, there we go. Okay. For the embattled reality of black teachers and students, we have almost no language. Their history is not only a story of triumph, nor only one of defeat. The heritage of black education requires the embrace of competing narratives, 
persecution, and resistance. While initially drawn to the subversive practices of Black teachers and their students, I found the language of resistance or the challenging of power to be accurate but insufficient. Scholars often focus on Black people's struggle to gain access to education, desegregation through courts, and exceptional narratives of individual educational achievement. This history of separate and unequal education is important, but while such narratives capture anti-Black persecution in the American school, they do very little to appreciate the art of Black teaching or Black educational strivings across generations. The everyday character of their resistance has largely gone unacknowledged. Fugitive pedagogy, Carter G. Woodson and the art of Black teaching is my attempt to offer a more balanced account. This effort has required new language to talk about the dynamic stories of Black education in the 19th century through Jim Crow. Fugitivity names more precisely the form that resistance takes in these contexts. Fugitivity is covert, concealed, hidden, planning and intentional strategy. What I call fugitive pedagogy consists of African-Americans physical and intellectual acts that explicitly challenged anti-Black protocols of educational domination. Actions that often took place in discrete or partially concealed fashion. To illuminate key aspects of fugitive pedagogy, I'd like to begin with the book's opening scenario. Tessie McGee read to her class in a steady measured tone, quietly engaging in a calculated act of subversion. She was black, 28 years old, and she taught history in 1933 at the only black secondary school in Webster Parish, Louisiana. The state's all white Department of Education and local school board gave clear instructions. Teachers were to keep the pre-approved outline openly displayed on their desks, which they were to follow closely to acquaint their students with the targeted learning objectives. Black educators and families in Webster Parish had little formal control over curriculum. Yet on many occasions, McGee made what she deemed to be necessary revisions to the mandatory curriculum. Based on her own judgment, and perhaps at the recommendation of fellow Black teachers, she often read passages from Carter G. Woodson's quote, book on the Negro, which rested comfortably in her lap. She kept the textbook out of sight, understanding that if she were to be caught, she would be vulnerable to the disciplinary practices of Jim Crow authorities, but she was undeterred. Quote, she read to us from that book, one of McGee's students recounted, when the principal would come in, she would simply lift her eyes to the outline that resided on the desk and teach us from the outline. When the principal disappeared, her eyes went back to the book in her lap. So for the remainder of my time, I wanna look closely at two pieces of this scenario, the teacher and the textbook. I'll offer a short reading of Ms. McGee's effort to escape the official curriculum by way of the hidden transcript literally resting on her lap and how Woodson's textbook, The Negro in Our History, rendered a competing narrative of Black life that defied racist school policies and curricula. The teacher. Tessie McGee's method of instruction constitutes a textbook example of what I call fugitive pedagogy. Her concealed lesson rejected the degrading representations of Black life in official school curricula, and such refusal manifested in physical form. McGee's public display of the official outline was a masked performance of complicity, an embodied text that accompanied the subversive and spoken content of her lesson. McGee's physical act of switching texts also communicated important messages to her students, demonstrating how defiance could at times be disguised by public performances of deference to the coercive regime of school authorities. Teachers like McGee gained access to alternative scripts of knowledge through what the sociologist Alden Morris has called insurgent intellectual networks. Institutions like Carter G. Woodson's Association for the Study of Negro Life and History and Colored Teacher Associations. Such organizations comprised a veiled yet networked educational world. One where black Americans said one thing and did another. Given rampant anti-Black violence, 
the true political intentions undergirding Black educational strivings were rarely on full display. African Americans responded often in quiet, calculated acts of resistance against oppressive school settings that reflected a world order built on their subjection. Fugitive pedagogy was a collective endeavor, even when manifesting as individual acts of practice. For example, the principal entering McGee's classroom was a black man named J.L. Jones. Records suggest that he supported the inclusion of black history and culture in Webster Parish. He was a leading member in the Louisiana Colored Teachers Association, which explicitly endorsed Carter G. Woodson and his work. And as reflected in the documents on the screen, Woodson regularly appeared on the programs at annual meetings of colored teacher associations and at the state and national level. It is not implausible then to consider that Jones and McGee may have very likely conspired together. The principal testing the teacher to ensure she could protect herself and the school if a white official entered the room. Wearing the mask, as Paul Lawrence Dunbar called it, had long been part and parcel of black teachers' professional disposition. In black segregated schools, the intrusion of white surveillance had a hand in shaping school ecology. It was not atypical for white people to drop by unannounced during the school day, either to show off their Negro schools to visitors or for routine inspections. Such visits were primarily meant to demonstrate power, which was essential to reproducing domination. This is to say, the person walking into McGee's classroom could just as easily have been a white school official. Black educators walked a tightrope when challenging such oppressive schooling contexts. If they were to fall or be caught, there was no safety net to catch them. In fact, just a few years prior, the white school board in Muskogee, Oklahoma, heavily influenced by the Ku Klux Klan, I should add, learned of Woodson's textbooks being used in the local black high school. The books were confiscated, teachers were reprimanded, and the principal was threatened and forced to resign. After reading the textbook, the school board, quote, expressed horror and surprise that such a work should have crept into our Negro schools, end quote. They assured their white constituents that they would be more vigilant moving forward, stating, quote, we must not take in teachers who will create discord by teaching isms of any sort, end quote. Examples of this kind of violent oversight are plentiful and they move forward and backward in time. Black teachers were routinely targeted and fired for challenging white authority. Some notable examples being Ida B. Wells in Tennessee, John W. Davison in Georgia, Anna Julia Cooper in Washington, DC, and of course, Septima Clark in South Carolina. And yet there were those who lost more than their jobs. Harry and Harriet Moore were fired in 1946 and later killed when their home was bombed in Mims, Florida. Black teachers' awareness of such stories prompted them at times to conceal their pedagogical objectives in the presence of intrusive white power. Subjection to surveillance and violence motivated by no causal logic whatsoever was a fact of blackness. African-American educators developed strategies to contest this reality, which ranged from broad institutional realms down to the interpersonal and psychic levels. Fugitivity in its historical reference holds in place both the realities of constraint and black Americans constant straining against said confinement. It is careful not to overstate one or the other. As Fred Bowden aptly notes, and I paraphrase, escape is an activity, it's not an achievement. The possible threat of recapture always lingered. Escape was unresolved and uncertain, and Black teachers carried intimate knowledge of such precarity. The textbook. My concern with historical framings of Black education began with the textbook. I had come across a passing reference to Carter G. Woodson's textbooks, one of which you see pictured on the screen being read by a group of junior high students in New Orleans in the 1930s. I was aware that Woodson played a central role in African-American studies. As the second African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard in 1912, and as founder of Negro History Week 
1926, which of course we celebrate today as Black History Month. But I was shocked to learn about the size and scope of his impact on educational practice during Jim Crow in the private spaces of Black teachers' classrooms. While most accounts emphasize his role as, as a historian, many referring to him affectionately as, quote, the father of Black history, much less has been written about Woodson's 30-year career as a public school teacher and leader among educators. And yet, Woodson worked fervently from his office at 1538 9th Street Northwest in the historic Shaw District in Washington, DC. From this post, Woodson responded personally to letters written by individual teachers. Some wrote him with historical questions. Others inquired in hushed tones about strategically working to challenge curriculum standards on a local level. Woodson and his small staff mailed textbooks to individual teachers in schools around the, across the country. They packaged Negro history kits by hand and shipped off decorative materials for teachers to refashion their classrooms. The wide circulation of his ideas and curriculum materials among black teachers implied for me a much more complicated story than those suggested by pervasive images of say dilapidated school buildings and the aggressive neglect of black education that tend to dominate public memory and in large part academic, on, academic scholarship on the subject as well. But what intrigued me most about Woodson's textbooks as well as those written by black public school teachers well before him was their extensive commemoration of fugitive slaves and black fugitive life. As early as 1890, black educators wrote textbooks filled with, historic, with heroic narratives about enslaved blacks who absconded from plantations, those who led slave revolts, stories of black maroon communities in the dismal swamps of Virginia, Suriname, Brazil, and Jamaica. But that's not all. The fugitive slave emerged as a folk hero and cultural symbol and curricula developed by black educators. The fugitive slave also appeared in school naming practices and within commemorative ceremonies in school activities and rituals. Black Americans established a heroic tradition around the stories and names associated with this pedagogy of escape. As a folk hero in Black curricular imaginations, the fugitive slave carried important insights about the interior life of teachers and students. It was this realization that prompted my reliance on the fugitive slave archetype and on fugitive pedagogy as a theory and practice of black educational life in the United States. The term is more than an elaborate metaphor. It names a phenomenon that surfaced within the archive at multiple levels. It indexes the embodied and intellectual acts of subversion that were central to black educational strivings while emphasizing how many of these acts transpired in secret. And what's more, the concept draws a narrative line from enslaved people's defiance of anti-literacy laws, which rendered black education and criminality as equal transgressions to actions like educators um, such as Tessie McGee. It was also clarifying to learn that the first black textbooks were actually written by fugitive slaves. James W.C. Pennington, an, enslaved, an escaped slave from Maryland inaugurated this tradition in 1841. A textbook on the origins and history of the colored people represents the beginning of a formalized practice of black people striving to rewrite the epistemological order. The fugitive slave William Wells Brown also wrote a textbook in 1863. So like newspapers, journals, and various other forms of 19th century black print culture, textbooks became tools, not only of the master, but also of the fugitive slave. Such counter readings of the world carried over to Woodson's theorizing about black education. In his iconic text, The Miseducation of the Negro, Woodson wrote, quote, starting out after the Civil War, the opponents of freedom and social justice decided to work out a program which would enslave the Negro's mind in as much as the freedom of body had to be conceded, end quote. He suggested that the political conflicts at the core of black education 
were fundamentally linked to the legacies and social technologies of enslavement. Woodson anticipates Saidiya Hartman's assertion that the linear progress narrative of slavery to freedom breaks down when we look at the material and social political conditions of black life after emancipation. So thinking with these scholars, fugitive pedagogy reconsiders black education in the post-Civil War era as intimately situated in what Hartman calls the afterlife of slavery or what Woodson termed, quote, the sequel to slavery. In his first textbook, The Negro in Our History, Woodson offered the following, quote, how some of these slaves learned in spite of opposition makes a beautiful story. Knowing the value of learning as a means of escape and having longing for it too because it was forbidden, many slaves continued their education under adverse circumstances, end quote. Woodson named the entanglement of violent white opposition and the enslaved people's steady practice of learning as a means of escape, offering it as a generative lesson for students and teachers during Jim Crow. Indeed, this was the origin story that framed what was politically at stake in their teaching and learning. This dialectic was the heritage of black education. At its highest calling, black education continued to be a stealing away from and refusal of the American school's official protocols and curricula. So I'd like to end my comments where I began. It's time we have new conversations about black education. And such new conversations demand new language or perhaps old language repurposed and infused by new semantics. Our modern word pedagogy derives from an ancient term for a slave who was tasked with teaching. The Latin pedagogus refers to a slave of relatively high status, if you will, who escorted children to and from a site of learning. Pedagogy were responsible for the moral development of their charges. They carried the children's books, supervised them, and sometimes taught them foundational educational skills. The enslaved also embodied unwritten lessons for the young master. They taught lessons of power to their charges who wielded authority over them by virtue of their differentiated social status and bloodlines, and the former's status as property, of course. The perspective of the enslaved yields a different script of knowledge, however, a witness to systems of power that rely on their subjection. In that fugitivus, Latin means flying, fugitive, or running away, especially a runaway slave, and that Pythagoras names the slave who makes learning possible, Pythagoras fugitivus then, the fugitive pedagogue, might be interpreted as the absconded slave who disrupts dominant protocols of knowledge production and the conditions under which it is taught. In fleeing from their assigned role in the order of things, pedagogy inspire new lessons. Their flight prefigures alternative paths of learning. Fugitive pedagogy in its ancient and modern historical meaning generally refers to the enslaved fleeing from dominant protocols of teaching and learning and the narrative scripts that structure these experiences. Their violent alienation demands their suspicion and refusal. As such, the entire apparatus of schooling is called into question when the enslaved think and plot their own course of action, when their response is flight, when they steal possession of their own life. Fugitive pedagogy, thinking now in the modern post-Middle Passage context, as conceptualized in my book, encapsulates the enslaved and their descendants engaging in the process of thinking the world anew. It is grounded in the assertion that those who have been marked as slave, as Black in the modern world, might initiate a new ceremony of knowledge. The Black teachers and students called upon in my book are portals into a heritage of fugitive pedagogy. I hope to have told their stories in a way that moves beyond mere description and narratives of heroic struggle, and instead teasing out insights about the deeper meaning of education and Black people's struggle for human goodness and flourishing, for a new world to be and new ways to be in the world. As Toni Morrison showed through her fictional character, Sixo, a language is only worth speaking or writing or singing if you can see a future in it. I look to Black teachers of the past 
whose fugitive acts can teach us so much about the future. They represent a tradition that has been plundered from today's black educators who are its rightful inheritors. And yet all who are committed to critical pedagogy or anti-racist teaching might draw inspiration from their legacy. I see the cast of characters in my book as standard bearers, a tradition passed through these teachers and their students. Their heritage is one worthy of both praise and deep study. Thank you. And so that's uh, where I'll end my comments. And I wanna uh, invite Professor Bennett to join me in conversation now. Um, if there are any kind of general thoughts that you have about anything that I've shared, but also your reading on the book, but I'm really interested also in some of the questions that you have that um, can help us have a dialogue about the kind of core um, contributions that the work is trying to make to black studies, to the history of education, um, and so many other things that you and I have been talking about over the past few years. Of course, brother. First of all, that was fantastic. And I love the nods to uh, both Winter and Morrison at the end. <clears throat> we always carry in the elders with us. Uh, and in that vein, so I have a methods question that's also a, a mythos question, right? So I was wondering if you could talk about your use of performance studies and what it means symbolically and otherwise for the Black students in this, this beautiful book, right? To embody freedom fighters and folk heroes, right? What is keeping track of performance, theatricality, gesture, the flesh, illuminate for us that might otherwise fall to the wayside? Yeah, I think one of the things that I really appreciate about um, the performance studies scholars and a number of folks who do, you know, uh, you know, historical ethnography and that kind of work is that uh, it really forces us to contend with the phenomenological aspects of what we see happening in the historical record, right? I, I knew for a fact that I didn't want to just write a kind of um, descriptive kind of narrative of, you know, the stories of Black education that I found that I was encountering in the archive because I knew that there was so much more layer to the experiences of what I was seeing, right? For me, it, it, was, it, it meant something, right, for students in the Jim Crow South who are, you know, writing and talking about the fact that their grandparents were enslaved people and then they're also embodying uh, performances of the Haitian Revolution, right, in the context of their Negro History Week ceremonies or reading lessons about people like Harriet Tubman and saying that encountering the photograph of Harriet Tubman reminds me, I'm thinking about Angela Davis's example when she says, when she first saw the picture of Harriet Tubman, she couldn't help but think about how much she looked like her grandmother, right? Um, and there, I feel like there's something about the kind of phenomenological aspect of black schooling in these stories um, during Jim Crow, but even before Jim Crow that I felt like I wanted to attend to and open up to help um, interpret what I saw happening, right? You can't just say that enslaved people are escaping to the woods and literally crime, climbing under the earth to learn how to read and write in the middle of, of the night, right? And just leave that there, right? That becomes a moment where we have to dig and mine to talk more about um, experience and black life in ways um, that require me as a researcher and as an observer of this history to, um, to be more thoughtful and careful about how I name things that are in the historical record that are easy to kind of just narrate past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's beautifully stated. And speaking of sort of just naming with care and excavation, you implot for us, you know, the story of Woodson's trajectory through what you call the pedagogy of his family history, right? So I was wondering if you could actually talk a bit uh, about the pedagogy of your own family history, perhaps specifically your grandmother's shed, if you, if you feel so moved, um, but also your earliest experiences at the, the intersection of Black kinship and Black schooling, right? Because you, you just mentioned Angela Davis, right? And these other student examples of calling upon not just teachers and family as these sort of separate nodes of their life, but perhaps as intertwined. So I was wondering if you could talk about that for a bit in your own life and maybe how that shaped your trajectory into the present moment. Well, I would just say that I, you know, there's a striking, there, there's a resonance between, you know, Woodson's personal um, narrative where, you know, he grew up, his first teachers were his formerly enslaved uncles, right? Um, he, he was re required to read from the newspapers for his formerly enslaved father, who was also, who he loved to refer to as a fugitive um, as well, right? Um, because his father was illiterate, but he was interacting with the literate world because Woodson was you know, reading to him, but also Woodson was reading to the literate community of coal miners. So we see the way that communal literacy 
becomes very central to Woodson's own intellectual formation before he reaches a place like Berea College or University of Chicago or Harvard, right? But in those moments, one of the things that we see from Woodson's life is that he's also interacting with the knowledge that these people that are formerly enslaved and former civil, civil war veterans, the knowledge that they're carrying with them, right? That they're speaking back to the information that he's decoding from them, from newspapers, from uh, books and things like that, that he's reading and they're interacting and you know speaking truth to power, so to speak, right? So he comes to have an understanding very early on, right? That black people also are carriers of knowledge and producers of knowledge and that it's important for us to um, take time to do the custodial work of making sure that that knowledge and that those experiences are preserved and that we offer a more expanded portrayal of black life than the way in which we find ourselves to be distorted in curriculum, right? Because, you know, Woodson, he doesn't even start high school until he's 20 years old. So these are things that he's exposed to much, much early on. And so it, from my own you know, experience, I'm writing about the history of black education, but I attended a very small black parochial school in Compton, California, where I had all black educators from preschool up and through um, eighth grade, and then a majority black um, student body and majority black teaching, uh, teaching faculty at the high school that I attended, was a, which was a public high school. And many of the educators that I had were operating in a tradition that I felt like I was encountering in the archive, right? And so while I don't rely on that in excess, it become, it, for me, it was an interpretive resource for how I engaged with the stories and the dynamics that I was seeing bear out in the historical material. Um, mm -hmm. To kind of, you know, certain things that I'm able to, that I felt like I was able to name came from my own experience, you know, coming from a community and family who had history, who I feel like continues to be distorted in the academy in particular kinds of ways um, and how we have to kind of stretch our imaginations to think differently about how we, um, how to accommodate these experiences and to lift them up in ways that are, um, that are done with, with, with care um, and with dignity. That's beautifully said. And I love too how even in that answer to the question, you're putting forward the life worlds of Black children. And that's something you do at Woodson as well in the book, right? You talk about his experience uh, with the McGuffey's reader and how that's actually part of how he sees himself entering a continuum of consciousness, the narrative of history. And I think this is reflected in both the content and form of the book, right? So I was wondering if you could say a little bit, not just about contemporary application, right? But what story do you want Black educators and Black students encountering this book to see themselves as contributing to? Well, one of the things I just want people to see is that there's very expansive and dynamic history to Black education. And I think that, you know, I, I'm always interested, I think it's important that we place ourselves within a, a broader story. You know, whether you're a teacher or whether you're a student, it's important for us to be aware of the, you know, the long history of the institutions that we are operating within. But it's also important for us to be aware that there are long established traditions that we can borrow from and see ourselves through the frame of, right? You know, I, I, I see that the teachers that I write about in this book as people as offering a sort of counter narrative for what it can mean and what it means to be a teacher, right? Um, and I think that, you know, people write about all the time, it's important for students to have counter narratives so that they can think differently about who they are in the world um, that, that defies or that refuses you know, kind of stereotypical representations of black life or for Latinx students, et cetera, et cetera. I would argue that the same thing is important for the professional identity of educators, right? What is the tradition that you understand yourself to be situated in? And I, I don't think that very much work is typically done for educators or students to see themselves as a part of a longer educational or intellectual history. Um, and you know, I, I think that there's a, it's a very powerful resource in the story of these teachers for black educators, especially, but really for all educators who are trying to do the work of justice in our schools today. Sure. So in that vein, I'm gonna go a little off script just because I'm, I'm very moved right now in this moment. So can you talk a little bit of, then about a sort of counter history of anti-racist pedagogy then? Because it strikes me that another piece of brilliant work you're doing in this book, right? Part of the, the problem with these racist textbooks is not just, at least it seems from Woodson's vantage, that they exclude Black people, right? But also that they romanticize a history of, a, of plunder, he says, right? Of conquest and domination. So can you talk a little bit, one, about 
a sort of counter history of anti-racist pedagogy, right? What are some other historical sources we might look to to inform the present moment? But also the, the lure of representation and maybe how people like Woodson and Winter help us get somewhere else other than just a more uh, inclusive vision where Black folks are just included in the vision just because, right? Instead of this more robust sort of strategy we see from Woodson and others. Yeah, so I'll take the, I wanna take the part of the second question that you asked there first. Um, yeah, Woodson would absolutely say it's not just about including <laughs> Black people and narratives of Black people into the, the, the narrative structure that we have already inherited for the kind of modern world that is one predicated on, you know, uh, racial chattel slavery and settler colonialism, right? Um, particularly Woodson is thinking about racial chattel slavery. He would say simply including Black faces and narratives into that story is not necessarily doing justice because underlying this kind of larger narrative script of history of the world of what it means to be human is embedded within that are certain kind of philosophical ideals, moral yeah. kind of orientations that are completely um, wrapped in wrapped up in the project of kind of you know building empire and anti blackness really you know quite frankly you know you know he would say and so it's not simply about just including Black people into the script to kind of offer a kind of um, a, a diverse set of faces, right, to tell the same story, right? He's saying that we actually need to kind of go through the experiences, or he's working to go through the experiences of Black people, right, to open up a new way of thinking about what it, to offer a human vision of what it means to be in the world and in relationship with one another. And that that's the point Black history is not just saying Black people were also there and they contributed to the greatness of, you know, America and all these sorts of things. It's like, yeah, you can say that Black people were there, you have to name them and treat their lives as, you know, because they're there as human beings, but there's also something different that their lives are, that their life is offering um, that's important, that's more than just a narrative of inclusion. Um, and then the other part about, I think the first part of the question, if I understand it correctly, is that, you know, absolutely. I think that many people exaggerate the novelty of what people we're calling currently anti-racist teaching, because when we look to the history of black education, we see that black folks in black, you know, in black education, anti-racism was kind of a fundamental thing of what black educators were always doing. And it wasn't only just anti-racist teaching though, right? Because if anti-racist teaching is about responding and reacting to white supremacy and responding and reacting to anti-Black domination, then it almost suggests as though our only purpose and the only, you know, our lives have no meaning without the, without the thing that we're trying to refuse, right? These educators are invested in challenging racial oppression, but they're also interested in sitting with the beauty of Black life, right? And thinking about, um, you know, things such as what it means to be in uh, kind of right relationship with one another in the context of the spaces and schools that they're creating. And that has more to do with just responding to the external pressures or kind of um, anti-Black hostilities in the world. It's like, it's both and. And it could never, a, a, a more expansive liberatory model requires both of those things or that full range um, of things. And so, you know, for instance, I think about often about, you know, bell hooks and teaching to transgress there's a, there's a part in the book when she says, um, for, black folks, for black folks, education has always been political because it was rooted in anti-racist struggle, right? Um, obviously, Bell Hooks is writing this in the early 90s, and she's writing about her segregated schooling experience in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, which is to suggest, of course, you know, the language of anti-racism is not new, and also the practice of doing it is not new, um, but also any liberatory model of education for black and brown folks has to be more expansive than that. Fantastic. All right, so there's a passage from your book that we discussed before this conversation, and I was wondering if you could read it, and then I have one last question for you before we pivot to q and if that's cool. We talked about a few passages, which one or which one did you set? Which <laughs> so I've been thinking a lot about how we can steal ourselves away, right, and sort of the, the psychosocial realities of anti-Black violence um, that these teachers are contending with, right? In these sort of clandestine ways. So I was wondering if you could, perhaps, I'll go right to the passage, brother. Uh, if you could read a bit from uh, page 
12? Yeah. yeah. Um, Go over from there. The criminality of black learning. Yeah. yeah. All right. So the criminality of black learning was a psychosocial reality. According to Frederick Douglass's master, a slave having learned to read and write was a slave, quote, running away with himself, end quote. Stealing oneself, not just stealing away to the North or stealing away to Jesus, but stealing away to one's own imagination, seeking respite in independent thought. The theft of one's mind was directly relational to, perhaps even a precondition for, the theft of one's body. For these reasons, enslaved people who, who could read and write were branded as objects of suspicion, marked as black fugitives learning flesh. So while a literate slave was supposed to be a contradiction in terms, black people's educational strivings were acted out in the space of this contradiction. Thinking in these structural terms, I would go as far as to suggest that the literate slave and their symbolic as well as literal descendants, black teachers represented an ongoing strike by black people against the conditions of slave work, whereby black folks were captive laborers to be super exploited within a national political economic system predicated on ch chattel slavery and its afterlives. The literate slave represents a protracted refusal by black people against the arbitrary logics of racial capitalism imposed on their lives. They insisted that they were more than a hand without a head, to paraphrase Frederick Douglass. Black teachers were the progeny of literate slaves whose educational strivings were an embodiment of fugitive spirit. The literacy and independent thought of the latter were coterminous with flight and black teachers post emancipation emerged as a professional class who embodied the very ideas of black aspiration and progress, making them symbols of inspiration and simultaneously prime targets of white aggression. Black education was a schooling project set against the entire order of things. This is something we must be clear about. In its resounding assertion that black people were rational subjects, that they were not simply hands without a head or captive laborers with no capacity for reason, black education has been a persistent disruption to the known world instituted through racial chattel slavery. This is the assertion embedded in the abolitionist David Walker's claim that, quote, for colored people to acquire learning in this country makes tyrants quake and tremble on their sandy foundations, end quote. It anchors Frederick Douglass's incisive observation that, quote, knowledge unfits a child to be a slave, end quote. The insistence on black educability troubled notions like those imparted by Thomas Jefferson the precursor to the American common school movement when he asserted that the Negro was incapable of producing poetry or original and reflective thought. Writing of Phyllis Wheatley, Jefferson maintained that poetry written by the blacks was simply quote, beneath the dignity of criticism. It was not just about a distaste for Wheatley's lyrical style or some lack of technique. It was an insistence that black people were beneath the threshold of humanistic potentiality. Jefferson's claim rested on the belief that the mastery of the arts and sciences and the production of literature were a visible sign of reason, the apex of human civilization, achievements beyond the realm of possibility for black people. The plot of black education insisted otherwise. In this sense, fugitive pedagogy was the pursuit of an otherwise arrangement of the world and what it meant to be human. Beautiful. So in so many ways, this is a book, it strikes me about black institutional life, right? So you write at length, right? About the ASNLH, the American Negro Academy, the M Street School, the list goes on, right? And you end with poetry, right? Last line of the book, you make this, uh, this reference to Langston Hughes, right? In the world that is not yet, but, but yet must be. So my question for you is, Jarvis, in this particular historical moment, how do we steal away together, right? Not just in individual moments and individual acts of, of reading or performance, but how do we steal away collectively as Black folks seeking out a future we can see ourselves in? Well, I mean, I, what I hear, I hear the question is you naming the fact that I'm talking about fug fugitivity, but I'm also emphasizing these institutions. Right, whereas so much of 
thus a lot of scholarship, whether it be the kind the undercommons or a number of other texts are really about kind of escaping kind of from institutions in a certain way. Um, but I felt like it was important in this book to emphasize the importance of black institutions um, historically, but I also think that there's something about the importance of black institutions that have continued to function um, in terms of offering a kind of counter educational tradition, even in the contemporary moment, because, you know, we, we can't just read the kind of contemporary language around fugitivity that's about anti institutions. When you see formerly enslaved people doing one of the first thing they're doing is actually working to build schools, right? Um, and, and obviously these institutions that they built were some of the, you know, prime targets of white aggression after the Civil War, right? Between 1860, between 1864 and 1876, over 630 black schools were burned down in the South, right? Um, but these, and I think about souls of black folks when Du Bois says, you know, 750,000 did the freedmen give of their poverty to the building of schools, right? And so many of these institutions, whether it be the ASNLH or colored teacher associations, right? The first one, you know, is built in 1861. They exist all up and through the Jim Crow period. And these are really these kind of advocacy organizations, but also organizations where we see um, black folks gathering and trying to operate um, and, and work collectively in trying to imagine a new way of, you know, a, a new set of intellectual traditions that's really you know, Woodson has to go outside of the school to create these institutions in order to influence the work that educators are doing when he's shipping out these textbooks and these Negro History Week materials to them, right? Um, it's, it's an organization that he creates from outside of the schools that teachers are then taking and bringing in with them because they understand that their mission is, is set apart from the structures that they're having to work within, right? So I think that there are a lot of lessons from how these educators operated um, and, you know, intentionally and had a very distinct set of politics around what it was that they were doing and how they were building, right, and building the resources that they needed um, in absence of those things being available and the structures that they had to operate within, right? And not saying that they're content with just having to operate in this fugitive kind of way because, you know, the mode of fugitivity is, is, is important, but the, trans the ideas that they're working to transmit are, are more important than the method, so to speak. Um, but yeah, so that, that's what I would say. I think that there are still important lessons from this historical context that we have to think about, about you know, what it means to empower communities to build the things that they understand to be good and necessary um, to meet the demands of their life. It's fantastic, brother. All right, let's pivot to this Q&A real quick and hear from the people. Uh, so the first question up is from Allison Pingree. Thank you, Professor Givens, for this incredible work. Could you say some more about the physical spaces for fugitive pedagogy? You mentioned that often the standard narratives focus on dilapidated schoolhouses that seems to contrast to the outdoor exercises teaching the value of Frederick Douglass. How did physical space shape these acts of fugitive pedagogy, if at all? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so there, I mean, in terms of physical spaces, you know, the tradition um, that is being named as fugitive pedagogy in the context of this book is not confined to the walls of the schoolroom, right? Mm -hmm. So much about you know the work that uh, that teachers are doing in the classroom are things that they're pulling from other spaces, whether that be these you know color teacher associations that they're in, where they're creating study groups to read you know um, to read material by you know black academic during the time period. There's there's one scene there's one um, scenario that I always think about, and it's all these teachers in New Orleans in the 1930s crowded in a gymnasium um, because. W.B. Du Bois comes to New Orleans and he's given a speech on some research that he's doing. And it's 1934. I know for a fact that it's 1934 because he's presenting on what would become his book, Black Reconstruction, published the following year. Hmm. And so you have all these teachers and students crowded in this gymnasium listening to the work that he's offering and what he's talking about, about rethinking about um, uh, Black political life in a period of Reconstruction. Um, but then you see the way in which these ideas that come from this meeting, this gathering, right, in this community space, and it shows up in different places, right? It shows up in, for instance, we can trace it the following year in a teacher's magazine in New Orleans where a, 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 a pre-service teacher writes a review of Black Reconstruction when the book comes out in their publication that they circulated at this teacher training school. But then we see 
you know, a, a, a Mardi Gras themed performance um, by students in one of the following years, also focusing on black, you know, black folks during the reconstruction period, right? Um, this is obviously an outdoor kind of um, performative, uh, ele you know, element that's organized at a school, but it's an outdoor celebration, right? So there are all these ways in which these ideas are circulating through multiple institutions and multiple spaces in these communities. And, you know, we know that learning is always contextual, right? Even when we think about schools today, what happens in classrooms is never just about what's taking place within the physical context of the classroom. Students are bringing things with them, so are teachers. And there's a, eco a broader ecological context that's shaping these experiences. The same is true in this context, um, in the historical record. But obviously, you know, churches are really important um, as alternative spaces. Um, but also, you know, when we think about, you know, the homes of some of these people, Tessie McGee, one of the things that I found really interesting that I found was that I learned that all of the teachers at the Webster Parish Training School, they lived in something you know, called a teacher. It was almost like, because it was in a rural part of Louisiana, so it was almost like a teacher dormitory. So you can just imagine, you know, if Tessie McGee is reading from this textbook to her students, you can just imagine the kind of idea exchange that's happening between the educators at the school, um, oh. whose, whose, whose professional and personal lives are kind of blurred in, in so many ways. Hmm. Beautifully said. It's from Deborah Fall. Dr. Gibbons, thank you so much for your comments and presentation on fugitive pedagogy. I'm wondering to what extent you engage HBCUs in your book. My recent project thinks of Black colleges in the contemporary era as places of, quote, escape and of opportunity. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, so um, HBCUs are very important. The majority of Black teachers during this time period that I'm writing are being educated at HBCUs. Um, there are a number of Black scholars who, be, who are you know, teaching at these schools. But it's also interesting that you know, HBCUs during this time period are not, uh, the formal curriculum of HBCUs are not necessarily in alignment with the work that Woodson is trying to do. In fact, Woodson is essentially pushed out of Howard University after, you know, during, after one year of teaching there, right, after he goes and introduces Negro history courses for the first time ever in the university's history, um, because of his challenges with the white president of the university um, and the kind of tensions that exist there because of the kind of oversight and the paternalism of this of the white president of Howard University at the time. And so Woodson essentially leaves after one year, right? Um, but even years prior to Woodson arriving, we have people like Elaine Locke and Kelly Miller making recommendations to the academic senate at Howard University for courses on, you know, um, uh, issues in, in Negro life or social problems in the Negro and the academic uh, committee rejecting these proposals and saying they don't think that it's necessary or important to have these sorts of courses at the university at that time. Um, mm. so it, it's important, but even as I say that, it's also important to note that you have all of these black scholars and students gathering. Of course, these ideas such as Woodson's, um, you know, um, Negro History Week and all this stuff is making its way into the university and HBCUs because when Black people gather, they bring all they bring these resources with them as well, despite the limitations of the formal structures that they're having to operate within. Um, and there's a really important book that talks about this called Shelter in a Time of Storm that just got came out last year by Jelani Favors that talks about what he refers to as the kind of um, the education that happens in the community spaces at HBCUs during this time period. Hmm. Beautiful. Brother, I want to close with a, a question from Professor, uh, the esteemed Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. She says, beautiful, brilliant brothers. Are there ways in which your pedagogy at your home institutions still echo with our fugitive ancestry and history? Um, well, that's, that's beautiful. I didn't know that Sarah, Professor Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot was uh, here. Um, but I, I, I appreciate that question. And I'm always trying to find ways, striving to be accountable to the traditions and the people who made it possible for me to be at the place that I'm at in the current moment. I'm always very aware of that um, as I'm studying this material, as I think about how I arrange and create um, you know, the syllabi for my classes. And I'm always trying to expose students um, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and elsewhere that there is you know, a very long and rich tradition that Black folks have offered and have been engaging in around liberatory models of education. 
Um, and that is you know, why I'm writing this book and trying to offer it for new ways and more expansive ways to think about what constitutes the history of education? What traditions of education do we hold up as models for students to study and to learn about what the deeper meanings you know, uh, of our work are in, in classrooms or in communities, wherever we're wor working and operating as educators? And I always try to hold up the, the, the his this history because I think it offers a kind of a moral imperative to the work that we're doing that I think we should be accountable to. Um, I try to be tr very transparent about that to students in the classes that I teach. And I also try to hold myself to that standard as well. Powerfully stated. Brother, it's been an honor and a pleasure to be in conversation. And thank you all for coming and kicking it with us tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again um, to Harvard Bookstore and to the Government Library for organizing this event. And I'll turn it over. <laughs> Well, one more round of thank yous. Thank you once again, tremendously to Dr. Givens and Dr. Bennett for sharing this knowledge and this fascinating conversation. Um, and thank you all of you out there for spending your evening learning with us. Uh, please learn more about this book and feel free to purchase Fugitive Pedagogy on harvard.com. I've included the link in the chat. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, have a great night, keep reading and please be well. Thank you everyone. Thank you.